Some of you may have a combination of the three, so try and figure out which order they came in so you can work out your dominant, your second and your third, okay? The question is this, what was the first thing you were conscious of when you woke up this morning? The answer is irrelevant. How did you get to that conclusion? Okay? Now, if you came to that conclusion visually, primarily, put your hand up, and you can put your hand up more than once in this time. You came to it tactile, through the tactile, yeah? And you came to it auditorily, through a thought. Okay? This is just a little exercise, but it helps you to define what most often, I'm not saying always, just most often you will find that there is an order which is probably more the one you use to gather infor information, ga gather data through one means other than another, than another means. And so it's good for you to realise that you will move betwixt and between the three means of gathering information, but it's also important for you to realise that uh, you do have a preference. Now, when um, I used to carry a little diary around like Liz's years ago until I got onto using the computer diary, and uh, when people would come to church for the first time and I'd introduce myself and they'd say their names and I'd go away and quickly write their name down on the top of the page of my diary for that particular week that they came um, and because I knew if I didn't write it down I wouldn't be able to remember it so I wrote it down as quickly as I could and then when they came again maybe two or three weeks later they would show up at church I would flip back through my diary and I'd have that name written there and uh, it would help me. And sometimes after a while, you know, I would look onto the screen of my imagination at my diary, which I didn't have with me, and I could still see the name written there. Okay? Does anybody else operate like that at all? Yeah. Even though you haven't got it in your hand, because you've seen it there written you can memorise it and it, it can bring it back to you. And you see, you need, in the things of God, in the things of God, you need to understand yourself because God deals with you according to who you are. He doesn't deal with you according to how Rob Bailey is. Okay, And you've got to understand that. God doesn't, and, and another thing is that God doesn't expect you to be what you're going to be in five years' time right now. And he does, he does expect you to have grown from five years ago. So, you know, he wasn't expecting you to be doing the things that you're doing now in God five years ago. He allows for that growth and development and he will challenge you about things today that he wouldn't have challenged you about five years ago. He would have let you off the hook. Yeah, well, it's just that it's not up to that yet. They haven't grown enough. They're not mature enough. And so God is working with us as we are and we need to, to understand and value that. Uh, Jesus actually points uh, them out to us, these things, uh, and the Apostle John mentions them too. In Luke's Gospel, Luke 11, 9 through 10, uh, So I say to you, ask, the auditory, and it will be given to you. Seek, how many of you ever played hide and seek? Look, seek, uh, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Okay, the tactile knock. And so we, need, we see here in this scripture, Jesus is actually saying, 
that of the five senses, the three that we will use the most are the visual, the auditory and the tactile. And we need to be aware of that. We need to know which works best for us. It's not to say that we can't use the other. Please don't think that I'm saying that. But understand that you will have a preference and that when you're reaching out to God, you will naturally go to your preference. Don't try and change that. Allow God to speak to you the way he created you. Okay? Uh, for everyone who asks receives, and he who fi seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, uh, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes and what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. So here's the Apostle John repeating what Jesus had taught him uh, to us and saying, hearing, seeing and touching. These are the means by which you gather data in the natural and in the spirit realm. So please uh, remember that because it's a key point. It's a key point in everything that I'm saying so that you will be able to uh, fully understand how God talks to you. God talks to me in a little different than the way he talks to you and he'll talk to you in a little different from another person. Don't become uh, hung up that you can't do it the way I do it or the way somebody else does it. And some people, you know, in fact... Some people who operate the gifts of the Spirit haven't got a clue how they do it. They just say, well, you just do it. <laughs> and you ask them to explain how you just do it and they can't tell you because, you see, they're not necessarily prophets. Prophets are to, uh, have the responsibility of teaching you how to do the work of the ministry. This is the work of the ministry. And so it's my responsibility to figure out how do I do that? And I have spent 40 plus years asking myself, probably the last 20 more than anything else, the last what, 25 years more than any, of how did I do that? How did I know that? How did I come to that conclusion? Asking myself and writing it down. And these notes are uh, the sum total. They're the the residue, as it were, of, of all of that thought boiled down into, into uh, these notes. And so I'm constantly trying. If I find myself doing this, doing something and I uh, haven't done it before, I say, how did I do that? Because I want to know so that I can teach the saints, so that they can do it too. You see, I'm trying to put more dots on the page so that when people draw their picture, it'll look more like what it should look like. Okay? And that's why I use that term, uh, more dots on the page, because it helps people to understand. Um, where are we? Reaching out to God. Uh, I'll just transfer across here to... Um, Asking God to clarify your perception. Some people are a little bit hesitant to do this, but God is very happy to um, give you another bite at it and let you, you know, like ask us a second time. Now, God, I think this is what you're saying to me, but can you tell me in a slightly different way so that I get to know that that's for sure that that's what you're saying? Okay, so God isn't offended when you ask for a clarification. And using this principle uh, to show us things, we can use elimination. You know, one of the things that a lot of people, if you ask them, what do you want to do with your life? And they say, well, I don't really know. I'm not sure. But if you ask them this, what don't you want to do with your life? 
they can very quickly tell you all the things they don't want to do with their life. And in so doing, they are eliminating large areas of possibility and leaving, standing bold and clear, the things that they do want to do. And we need to understand that it's easy at many times to eliminate the things we don't want to do than it is to conclude what we do want to do. And it's the same in the realm of the spirit. For instance, if you were to imagine in your mind you have three options and each of those options in your mind's eye, this is good for visual people, it doesn't work so well for auditory, but they can do it, work with it the same. Um, each of those options, one, two, three, and a fourth option being a question mark. Okay? You're imagining there's four little boxes, each of them being an option, and you ask God to point to that. Ask him to point to the one that is closest to the truth. Now, some people might say, oh, that's pushing it really, the envelope a little bit. Well, yeah, maybe. But the thing is, God wants you to know the truth, doesn't he? And the truth will set you free. So God, I've had people um, who've stuck on things like this and they've gone away, as I've explained this little exercise to them, they've gone away and they've done the exercise and they've come back with a clear understanding as to what God, they've got peace in their heart, confirming that they know what God wants. And so this is just a little exercise. There's nothing spiritual about it in the sense that, uh, you know, the exercise itself. But we're relying on the Holy Spirit, and this is where it gets spiritual. We're relying on the Holy Spirit to point. And we're relying on him to identify which. And if he keeps pointing to the question mark, you know that you're asking the wrong question. And so it's always good then to go back and sort of say, okay, God, I'm not getting the right question. Can you help me? Can you help me? Okay, now he may not say it immediately. Maybe several weeks pass before suddenly you're sitting in church or maybe you're talking to somebody and they say something and suddenly you say, that's it. And they look at you funny and they say, what do you mean that's it? <laughs> oh, just something that I was talking to God about I needed to know. <laughs> and uh, what you just said helped me to clarify that. Okay, so it can come in many, many ways uh, that God um, actually speaks. Um, this next little bit of, of information here is... Uh, about blind people and uh, where are we just uh, blind people's dreams do you know what a blind person's dream look like scientists at wits sleep laboratory you might say why are we talking about blind people because I'm wanting to emphasize the natural um, is built on the spiritual okay Scientists at the Wits Sleep Laboratory in Johannesburg, South Africa, say they have a fairly good idea. Apparently, people who lose their sight after the age of seven can still have very vivid visual dreams up to 20 and 30 years after the loss of their vision. So they've lost their vision sometime after seven years of age, but then once they've lost their vision... They can still, in their dreams, they still visualise. Those born blind or who have become blind before the age of five do not see in their dreams. But their dreams are still rich, as rich in narrative, the auditory, and, those, and detail as those of sighted people. See how the brain works when that one faculty is taken away, the others step forward and begin to fill in the gaps for them. The scientists say congenitally blind dreamers report more intense sounds than sighted dreamers do. And deaf people often see brighter colours 
and dream in sign language. <laughs> okay? So they, they see people talking in sign language. It's in their dreams. Now this is just a little glimpse in how your brain works and how God created us. A wonderful um, little bit of information. I just present it because I think for some of you it will be significant. For others, it came to pass. It didn't come to stay. Don't worry about it. Okay? So uh, reaching out to God, we need to uh, be able to do that effectively. In trying to explain spiritual concepts, I've defined the spiritual in the natural terms. Some, some people may not like to hear spiritual concepts explained in such mundane ways as I'm talking about. In fact, some people get upset with me because I'm bringing it in their eyes, bringing the spiritual realm out of the mystical into the natural realm. And, and I have to say to them, well, really, God didn't intend it to be mystical. He didn't intend it to be totally hidden from us. He wants us to understand it, to search it out and understand it. Um, hearing God's voice and seeing into the realm of the Spirit are not meant to be mystical and unknowable. Some people who move in the gifts of the Spirit like to make them more mystical than they are because it elevates them. It elevates them, makes them, we are the possessors of the mystical. Yeah, that's right. You've probably met somebody. You might be sitting next to somebody or maybe they're sitting next to somebody who is like that. But let me tell you, let me tell you, God didn't intend it to be mystical and unknowable. He wants every one of us to be able to do these things. Rely on the Holy Spirit to open your ears and eyes to hear and see. Only he can do this. You see, if you're honest with yourself, and this is very important, and you say, show me on the screen of my imagination what I need to know God, and he doesn't show you, don't manufacture it yourself. Don't try and put a picture there yourself. Go to the auditory, to the tactile, and say, well, God, if you can't show me, if I'm not able to receive a picture of it, then explain it to me some other way. And, and utilise the visual or the auditory or the tactile when you're not getting it in the way that you would first prefer to. To have it come. Now, I don't think this is in your notes. God taught Jeremiah how to um, hear the voice of God. And Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9, it reads Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over the nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord, verse 11, came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? What do you see? What are you seeing, Jeremiah? So God was directing Jeremiah, was obviously a visual person, and so God says to him, what do you see, Jeremiah? And Jeremiah, see, I see a, a seething pot coming out of the north. And God, because he was in the, getting into the flow of it by then, he begins to explain what he senses the seething pot was all about. And so he, he teaches. And then God repeats the exercise again. What do you see, Jeremiah? And Jeremiah says, he sees this and that and the other thing. And, and God says, yes, and this is what that means. And so we need to understand that what I'm telling you isn't something 
that I cooked up. It's here in the Word of God. It's there for us to see if we are only aware of it. And uh, many times in my experience, I've come from the experience and then go search the Scriptures to find out it, if I can validate it from the Scriptures. Some people work from the Scriptures, and like Mark Verkler, um, he saw his wife operating instinctively in the gifts of the Spirit, and to him it was like a foreign realm, just completely and utterly foreign to him. And so he went to the Scriptures, and he began, he'd ask his wife something and she would, she didn't know how to explain it, but she did the best she could to explain what was happening to her when she was doing this. And then he would go to the Scriptures and he'd search through the Scriptures and he'd read piles of books, 30 or 40 books on a subject, um, just to come up with one little piece of understanding that his wife got instinctively. <laughs> And he wanted to validate it from the Scriptures. And once he validated it from the Scripture, then he stepped out and said, on the basis of God's Word, I believe I can do that. And so he came from a purely... He is very... How many of you are aware of Mark Verkler? You know him or know of him? Um, and he is a very, very mind-orientated very, very auditory, very, very uh, logical as far as the mind is concerned. Not that the other is illogical, it's just logic in a different realm. And uh, we need to understand that what he was doing was coming from a purely auditory perspective. And he was trying to understand through the scriptures what his wife was experienced. He didn't for a moment doubt what his wife experienced, but he needed for him, he needed to see it in the word of God before he would trust it to actually step out and do it himself. And so when he, he operates in the gifts of the spirit, he operates quite differently than what I would. I, I actually came into this experience, just put your hand up when it's time. Um, I, I came into this experience in a, just so uh, manner, the manner just happened. I didn't even know that I was doing it, that I was getting words of knowledge. And I would be leading worship in my early 20s in this little church over in Port Lincoln and uh, I would be uh, just leading worship and I'd sort of just sense something and I would just say it. I never thought that's a word of knowledge. I just said, I'm sensing there's somebody here with, with this or that or the other thing. And, you know, I would lead worship in the home meetings and back in those days home meetings were like little church services. Um, and... Uh, and we, we'd have, you know, some songs and then we'd have some prayer and so on. It was just like a little church service. Um, but in doing so, I was exercising the gifts of the Spirit. One night I had a word of knowledge and it was, this person was, was under a, a very heavy, dark, thick, dark cloud and a couple of people said, mm, I've been a bit depressed lately, but, you know, what you're describing is too, too out there for me. Anyhow, I was working at night time. I went um, to, to work straight after the home meeting, busied myself getting, mixing up all the bread. And then after a while, I'm standing there watching the dough mix and the thoughts begin to come through my mind. And suddenly I thought, I wonder whether that was a word of knowledge. You see, God was saying, now it's time for you to know what you're doing, Rob. <laughs> and the next day I went and spoke to somebody, a senior person in the church, and, um, who'd been in the meeting the night before, 
And I said, last night, was, was that a word of knowledge? And they said, yes, as a matter of fact, that was me that you were talking about. I didn't know at the time, but I found out years later that that person had been going through a breakdown um, at that time. And it just uh, they were under this thick, heavy black cloud and they just were unable to cope. And I described perfectly the situation and they said, oh, that was me. Um, but they hadn't wanted to say that out in, in the meeting. So uh, we just prayed together briefly. And, and, but see, God was bringing encouragement to that person, bringing encouragement by revealing, hey, I know where you are. I know what you're experiencing. I know how you're feeling. Do you think that that would be an encouragement to that person? I think it would be a big encouragement. Great. Okay. Still got five? Okay. Uh, God wants to communicate more than we want to hear. Uh, many times we are not so willing to hear what God has to say to us. Uh, the fact is God wants to speak to us more than we want to hear him is abundantly seen in Scripture. Often we need to be still so we can hear his voice. Often we're not listening so we don't hear him when he does speak. You know, Jesus said, My sheep will hear my voice and my sheep will follow me. They'll follow my voice. And so if we are the sheep of God's pasture, then it stands to reason that we're going to hear his voice. And if we're not hearing his voice, the scripture very clearly says we better be sure that we are his sheep. We'll come to that eventually. Okay, hearing spiritually. When you want to hear in the spirit, use the same process that, you would, that uh, enables you to hear in the natural. But this time, instead of expecting to hear a natural sound, you listen to hear God speak to you in the inner man of the heart. The words will register in your mind, perhaps. Uh, use this process of natural recall to learn the process of spiritual hearing. You know, when we listen, somebody says, ha, what was that? And we, we tend to 